Michael Harner, who is a, an anthropologist, also a shaman himself, he accuses the Western traditional scientific framework of being ethnocentric, being sort of culture bound, and also he says it's cognicentric. That means it takes into consideration or takes seriously only what you experience when you are in the ordinary state of consciousness. It ignores any kind of serious data which are coming from non-ordinary states. It just doesn't want to deal with that whole area. That whole area is referred to the realm of pathology, something that doesn't have anything to offer that we don't have to be interested in. And of course what happens that you pathologize some of the best parts of human history. You know, all the saints, all the prophets, all the shamans are just a bunch of ambulant psychotics who had the the luck that they lived in cultures that didn't have good psychiatry yet, so they got away. <laughs> Not only got away with what they were talking about and experiencing, but they even get appreciation from their tribes and their cultures. So this is what I would like to uh, talk about. If you now change your consciousness, if you go into a different state of consciousness, how you might experience yourself, how you might experience the universe, and what kind of insights you might get uh, into who you are and what it is all about, and how that insight will differ from uh, the one that we share in everyday life. And then, of course, there is the problem, how do you reconcile those two? That is the catch-22. If you have then two different ways of looking at things, how do you live with them? Which of them do you choose or honor and under what kind of circumstances and how do you dance, you see, between those two. This is where you can learn a lot from shamans, shamans who feel very comfortable in both realities. They can choose the way they experience reality depending on circumstances. Now I'll start with something that's um, sort of autobiographical memory which will sort of frame it for you. When Christina and I met, uh, she uh, was a follower of Swami Muktananda. She was very much into Siddha Yoga. I had known at that time uh, that Muktananda wrote this book, which was called at that time The Guru, later was known as The Play of Consciousness. Uh, several of our friends actually were trying to mediate meeting between us, but it somehow had never happened, so we never met personally. And when uh, Baba came to Oakland, uh, Christina, of course, wanted to see him. It was only three hours' drive from Big Sur. And she very much wanted me to meet him because, you know, he was a very important part of uh, her life. Yogic type is very much the Pakta type, which is the devotional type. I never thought about myself as a Pakta. If I was thinking about those four different ways that you can take in yoga according to the Indian tradition, so I can really identify with jnana yoga, which is you push your intellect, you know, to the point where it can't go any further and has to surrender. That's one of my uh, possible roads. Uh, <clears throat> the other one was uh, raja yoga, which is the way of experiment. You do something with your mind and then you have certain kinds of experiences. And that sort of mediates your union with the divine. Karma yoga was all right, but not great for me. <laughs> and sort of, you know, bhakta yoga was somewhere way down on the, on the ladder. And I had actually some uh, experiences of my friends who were workshop leaders, and, you know, they announced a workshop at Esalen, and they would go to an intensive with Muktananda, and then they show up sort of with, you know, eyes shining. And then the workshop comes, and they just refuse to do what they announced, what they promised, and they... <laughs> bring a little drums and a couple of cymbals and they want to chant uh, Om Namah Shivaya was the group and so a few of my friends got into trouble and it didn't impress me I had a sense of uh, you know I had a sense of, of duty and obligation if you promise a workshop and people come from all over the place you should deliver what you were supposed to deliver So I wasn't very excited about meeting Muktananda. On the other hand, I was very curious, you know, to see all kinds of phenomena that were happening in this sort of new age scene. So I was a little ambivalent, but we ended up in the car going to Oakland. And we came about 20 minutes early. 
and parked the car, and we were sitting in the car. We had a, what's called a personal darshan, which means just you know personal meeting with him. And as we were waiting, I said, you know, why don't you tell me something about Muktananda? So I, I'm somewhat prepared for this. And so she started telling me, you know, some things about him. And at a certain point, she said uh, he was a Shaivite, and that really attracted my attention, because by that time I had had quite a few psychedelic experiences, you know, in various contexts with various substances. And uh, the experiences of the Shiva archetype were among the most powerful and meaningful. I really connected with that. And I had a long history of interest in Indian philosophy. My mother, when we were still in Czechoslovakia, was uh, one of the followers of Paul Brunton. Some of you might know the name. He was a British uh, philosopher who spent some time with Sri Ramana Maharshi and then also went to Egypt. And he wrote books where he popularized spirituality. He wrote books like Search in Secret Egypt, Search in Secret India, and so on. And then he traveled, and he had groups of followers, and he did meditations with them and lectures and so on. And so she belonged to one of the groups, and when I was 12, she actually took me to one of those groups. And I, this was my first exposure to Indian philosophy, and I was instantly interested. I would start sort of reading whatever I could get my hands on. And very quickly, I knew more than the people in the group, theoretically. But then there was a problem that they were meditating, and I just I couldn't meditate. I would sit down, you know, my mind was all over the place. I felt, you know, there's so many interesting things to do who would possibly just want to sit and be there. So it all stayed just in my head. And then later, when I was studying medicine, I took about four years of Sanskrit. Again, there was a pull, you know, towards India. And uh, I loved to be informed about Indian philosophy. But it was a kind of like for coffee table discussion, like, you know, when you are in a party and people talk about Hinduism, so you know what to say, you sort of know the terms. And it never occurred to me that it had any deeper relevance. I thought those guys on the Ganges didn't have enough to do, so they, you know, <laughs> said, and said uh, <laughs> let me think what the universe works like. And then they came with these interesting ideas about it, and they made up these stories, fairy tales about Kali and Shiva and so on. And this was a tremendous surprise for me when in my psychedelic sessions all this came alive. I mean, I realized Hindu, Buddhist mythology, those are maps of consciousness. I mean, those are states that become as real as anything that you've experienced in your everyday life. So this was a tremendous surprise for me. And some of the most powerful experiences came in the context of the Shiva archetype. I actually illustrated in the book The Adventure of Self-Discovery, the four perinatal matrices, you know, with my own experiences from psychedelic sessions, and the most powerful ego death rebirth experience came as a confrontation was Kali, surrender to Kali, and then sort of being destroyed by the destructive aspect of Shiva, and then having what I felt was an Atma Brahma union, so it was all in the Hindu framework. Some people with whom I discussed it, they said, well, you just had been exposed too much to Indian philosophy and Sanskrit, this, you know, stayed in your head, and this is why all this came but I saw it the other way. I saw that that archetype was already working in me, and I was sort of attracted to these things like Brunton and Sanskrit because the archetype was there. It worked the other way. Because when it came alive, it was way beyond anything I have ever studied about these things. I mean, there was a, you know, lots of details, and there was also this tremendous experiential power, the, the convincing quality of those experiences. So two of those experiences were, one was the ego death, when I felt that as I was being crushed, the ego was being crushed. I connected with the image of the dancing Shiva crushing the little dwarf under. And then I, later I found out that this is actually one aspect of uh, meaning of that particular image. And then much later I had a very powerful psychedelic experience uh, where I experienced something like this fantastic archetypal river that was the river of time and was sort of flowing back to source. Everything was being called back to the source of creation. And there was like a holographic image of the dancing Shiva. And there was sort of, I saw dinosaurs, you know, the whole species originating and then sort of being there for a while and then going into this river and being sort of carried back to the source and civilizations sort of originating and coming back. 
so the, the whole image of Shiva was ex something extremely, extremely important for me. And so when I heard Shiva and Shaivite, I became instantly a little more interested. And I also knew that the dancing Shiva has a datura plant in the, in the crown. And there's datura growing around many of the Shiva temples in India. And they actually use datura as a sacrament, which is a very powerful psychedelic uh, plant. So at that point, I knew that he you know, had all kinds of experiences that we can sort of uh, communicate about. So by the time the darshan came, you know, within those 15 minutes, my expectations sort of were really way up there. I also told Christina those two experiences and never discussed them, which I had had with Shiva in that car during those 15 minutes. And then we walked into the ashram. It was time for the darshan. And uh, I walked into the door, and then sort of Muktananda asked me to sit down by him. And then he did what uh, he seldom did, which was he took off his glasses. He always wore dark glasses. And then he looked into my eyes from about four inches, sort of he was studying, looking something. And then he sort of patted my shoulder and said, you're a man who has seen Shiva. This is very good. This is very good. <laughs> uh, and that just absolutely blew my mind. You know, so, 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 I mean, you know. Yeah, the, and, you know, there are coincidences, but this looked like this was a little too much. <laughs> and then we started talking, and um, the subject was basically psychedelic plants. We were talking about uh, Soma, which, is, which was very much my interest. It was um, clear that uh, there was a psychedelic plant, there was a psychedelic potion, which was a sacrament and became the source of all of the Vedas. You know, a lot of the stances in Rig Veda are about Soma, how it grows, how you prepare it, and then what happens to people when they take Soma, half of them being on the, on the earth, half of them being in heaven. And the potion was considered so powerful that it was given a name of the God. Soma is the name of the God. And somehow, in the course of history, the secret of it got lost. Nobody knows now exactly what the plant was, and of course we cannot then identify what the active alkaloid is. And the part of me that is scientific really was having a painful experience that there was a missing link, and you know, if we could fill in that knowledge, you know, we would know more about uh, psychedelics and how the mind functions and so on. So one of my interests was you know, to find out somehow what Soma might have been. So we started talking about it. Uh, it turned out that uh, he knew that Soma was still being used in India and then on his birthday there were Vedic priests coming down and they were actually taking Soma ritually. Later he actually wanted to arrange for us the meeting with these priests and then we were supposed to go there uh, in May and in October he died so we never really connected with this tradition. But anyway, so we talked about Soma and then he went and started talking about Ganja, about charas, about pang, you know, which are the different uh, marijuana type uh, derivatives of hashish and how people use it wrong in the West and how some of the Brahmans do it right. You grow it sort of with a lot of reverence and uh, you soak it in water for 14 days and so then they smoke it, uh, you know, in chilams and then they lie on uh, the ice in the Himalayas in ecstasy. So we spend, you know, the darshan pretty much talking these kinds of things and I thought this is the way it's going to stay the darshan was slowly coming to an end and then <clears throat> uh, suddenly Baba reached sort of behind him there was uh, in the ashram there was a thing about sweets there was a place called the Amrit which was uh, a shop that had the best and the, you know the sweetest confections and and sweet tea and coffee, Siddha Yoga coffee. And uh, he was always giving candy as prasad. And he said the Shakti likes candy, you know, likes uh, the sweets. So he had a big can of almond roca, and he sort of reached for it, took a couple of them, shoved it into my mouth, and then was sort of slapping me over the head, over the face, and then also kicking me in the shin. <laughs> 
and uh, then he then he sort of lifted me and was pushing me out of the door and uh, Christina was sort of following and then on the way he said we'll be having two intensives uh, here which were kind of weekends like something like what we are doing here where people meditate and he was also giving what's called Shakti Path, sort of awakening of Kundalini and he said we'll have two consecutive intensives they are on Kashmir Shaivism he says it's going to be very interesting for you just come as my guests and that was it we ended up in front of the door there were people lined up because as you know in these spiritual centers a lot of people had had psychedelics it opened them for spirituality and then they try to find some other ways of entering those spaces so in many of these ashrams you find people who have some psychedelic history so there were all these people within Siddha Yoga who had done some psychedelics and had some conflicts about it and didn't know if Baba approved or didn't approve and they knew that if we have some conversation the psychedelics very likely will come up so this did Baba talk about LST and what did he say about psychedelics <laughs> and I felt tremendously reluctant to discuss anything with anybody I felt something was churning in my head and I wanted to be alone I wanted to know what was happening so there was a large hall in uh, in Oakland and I walked to the furthest corner I sat down with my back into the corner and I closed my eyes and went into a meditative state I wanted to know what was happening and like within second I just completely lost it and I went into this place which was the void which was you know the closest thing I can compare it to from the phenomenal world was like being somewhere in the middle of the universe interstellar space you know where there is absolutely nothing there are no celestial bodies just a sense of total total emptiness vastness and in just incredible peace there was still consciousness there but you know there were no realities around me and uh, when I opened my eyes again you know there's lots and lots of time passed uh, and I just had no recollection it was just absolutely empty space and that impressed me because uh, <laughs> You know, first of all, I had a couple of almond rockers and those slaps were... Uh, uh, um, I thought that was a pretty good technique, you know, for... Uh, um, uh, evoking that kind of depth of an altered consciousness. But there was something else which was an element of absolute surprise because I had some intellectual understanding of Kundalini and Kundalini Yoga and my um, idea about it was that it's associated with Kriyas, which means you will have powerful emotions and there would be, you know, shaking and there would be energies. And the idea that you would just go into this state of extinction was just not part of my expectations. You know, had I been twitching or something like that, I would have uh, had less respect because it would follow my expectations and the mind can create all kinds of things. So we were driving back and I said, I, you know, this has been quite interesting and um, uh, how would you feel if we, you know, go to these two intensives? Uh, I didn't know at that time what Kashmir Shaivism was, although I knew, you know, other forms of Indian philosophy. So I was kind of interested in going and we ended up on these two consecutive weekends attending these intensives which was again a lot of meditation, there was a Shakti path, the Baba was walking around and doing different things to different people to get these energies going. And there were talks, some of them by Muktananda, but some of the basic theoretical stuff was covered by somebody called Swami Tejo, who was one of the Swamis. And he came and started talking about Kashmir Shaivism, describing the system, giving various metaphors, images, and I was growing increasingly paranoid. About six years prior to then, I had written a paper which was called LSD and the Cosmic Game. The subtitle was Outline of Psychedelic Ontology and Cosmology. And this book that I'm planning to write now is going to be an expansion of that paper. What I did at that time, I had access to about 5,000 uh, records from psychedelic sessions, about 3,000 where I sat personally and 2,000 from my colleagues 
and I went through those records and I would look specifically at the places where people were dealing with cosmic questions involving God, time, space, creation, things of that kind. And I wanted to know what philosophical insights are coming from these states. And as I was putting it together, I found out to my surprise something totally different than what I expected. I thought that people will come up with totally different cosmologies because they're different people and you would expect that they will think about these things differently, I would experience them differently. But something very different happened and that was that what these people were experiencing were bits and pieces when if you put them together they create kind of one overarching cosmology where everything fits together and you get a comprehensive image of the universe and our place of the universe. And those were people who didn't communicate necessarily with each other. Many of those people were coming on outpatient arrangement and so on. Some of those people had sessions at different times, so there was just no way, you know, that there was any kind of significant exchange that would account for this. So it was clear that somehow non-ordinary states would put people in touch with a cosmology that was somehow universal. So I sat down and I wrote this paper, which was published in the Journal for the Study of Consciousness. LSD in the Cosmic Game. And this character was reading bits and pieces of my paper. I mean, he was using the same metaphors which I had in that paper. And for quite a while I couldn't believe that this could be independent. I thought, this guy must have got hold of that paper because he was simply reading my paper. Now, for you to get an idea what was happening there, Kashmir Shaivism is considered one of the highest forms now of Indian philosophy is one of the tantric systems, not the left-handed system, but the tantric in the broader sense. Actually, when we did the conference in Bombay, which was on uh, spiritual systems and science, there were many of the scientists who were talking about convergence of mysticism and science were actually specifically using Kashmir Shaivism, astronomers, biologists, and so on. So it's an extremely sophisticated, interesting system. Now the way it came into existence was that a seer in uh, Srinagar, which is the capital of Kashmir, had a vision in the 8th century, a vision directing him to some rocks in the surroundings of Srinagar. He would go there, expose the rocks, and there were some inscriptions. And these became known as the Shiva Sutras, as the kind of Bible of Kashmir Shaivism. Now, the material I was working with, those were experiences of people mostly Slavic, you see, Czechoslovakian in the 20th century, who got this stuff that had been discovered by a Swiss chemist, and we were experimenting with it in a modern context. So the idea was, what is the connection, you see, between this material that comes from a drug state in the 20th century and something that came from a vision or a vision at least that was directing that person to a rock and it, who knows how long it had been carved in that rock, these Shiva Sutras. So anyway, that is a framework for this. So many of the experiences I will be talking about are experiences that people had in psychedelic sessions Then we found out that exactly the same kind of experiences can happen with the breathing and uh, we had also few of those experiences without doing anything and I had some experiences, as I mentioned, with Muktananda, which were just experiences that were produced by techniques which didn't involve any drugs, which involved all kinds of manual maneuvers and so on, pressing the eyes and things of that kind. So one of the questions, the first questions I was asking in this paper was, uh, what do people experience as God? If there is something like spiritual quest, when do people feel that they actually arrive, that they now are experiencing the supreme principle in the universe? Now you find out that many people experience deities in these states, and you must have seen it in these groups this weekend. I presume that some people confronted some archetypal entities, a great mother goddess or something in that category. So if you do this work with the breathing or with psychedelics, many people will encounter deities. They will encounter gods and goddesses from various cultures. And again, the fascinating thing is that 
in each person the culture will be different. My background was basically atheistic. I never had any exposure to religion myself. This was uh, due to a scandal in our family. When my parents met, this was in a small Czech town, they fell in love and they wanted to be married. My mother was from a very strictly Catholic family, uh, but my father didn't have any church affiliation, so it was a kind of pagan by the standards of the local church. And my grandparents insisted that any decent marriage has to be conducted in church. And the local church in this small Czech town refused to marry them because my father was a pagan. And so there was just incredible hassle around it. And my grandparents were fairly rich by those standards, not necessarily by American standards. So they finally gave a major financial donation to the church. And then as a result of it, they were willing to uh, ease their rules and marry a pagan. Uh, and that so disgusted my parents that they decided that when I was born and then my brother, that they wouldn't affiliate us with any religion and that we should you know, make the choice ourselves when we come of age. So I had absolutely no exposure when there were classes in religion. This was a leisure for me. I would go play soccer or read something or go for a walk. And then, of course, went to the medical school with this kind of atheistic background. That doesn't cultivate the mystical consciousness. Uh, so that was the typical arrogant approach which we have in Western science, like um, see what we have done, and if we sort of hang in there, we'll know it all and we'll control it all. And this was also in a Marxist era, so this was a particularly materialistic kind of uh, education. So I had absolutely, until my personal experiences with psychedelics, I had absolutely no exposure to religion. Actually, the reason I became excited about Freud uh, was when I read Freud, uh, I was very impressed what he was able to do with religion or to religion. I found it very, very difficult that millions of people and all over the world and all through history would go for something as obviously idiotic, so irrational as religion. And here was Freud who was giving me the explanation. You know, when he starts uh, Totem and Taboo, he uh, mentions this uh, case that Shandor Ferenczi described, which was the case of a little boy who went to pee in a pigsty and there was a mother hen sitting on eggs and she got startled and attacked him and pecked him on the penis and as a result of it he developed this complicated neurosis where he venerated chickens and roosters and then <laughs> was also uh, was also afraid of them and then refused to eat their meat and so on and then Freud connected this with totemism and taboo and wrote the whole book that was inspired by this and that's impressed me you know uh, <laughs> You know, uh, finally there was an explanation of what those people are doing. That's obviously, this is an obsessive compulsive neurosis of humanity. This has to do with suppressed anal characters that sort of lead you into these obsessive rituals. And now I had it all down now, intellectually, until I had the experiences. And, and I realized that Freud completely missed the boat, that he was reducing religion to ritual, and completely missed that at the cradle of each major religion is a direct visionary experience of some other realities, which we call now transpersonal experiences. So anyway, this was the story of my own opening into spirituality, paradoxically through science, you know, which doesn't happen that frequently. Usually it's the other way around. You come from a heavy-duty religious programming, and when you are exposed to Western science, you sort of reject it all because it seems irrational. It doesn't make any sense. So when you enter non-ordinary states, you can have experiences of deities, and these deities can come from different cultures. So my background was atheistic. Uh, I was brought up in, in Central Europe, and my death rebirth experience came in connection with Kali and Shiva. For some other people, it could be uh, an Egyptian thing. They could experience it in Egyptian context as an Isis Osiris kind of thing. Uh, somebody else can have it in a pre-Columbian framework and so on. So it's coming from the collective unconscious. Now these experiences can be extremely powerful. There are enormous energies, there could be ecstatic raptures, or if it's a demonic deity of some kind, it can be you know, unbelievable horror. 
But when you study it, when you talk to people who have these experiences, when they have these experiences, they never have the experience that they are meeting the ultimate principle. Those are deities, but that's not God. So there's an interesting idea, an interesting question. How are these things related to the creative principle? And Joseph Campbell, I think, had done some incredible job on this, showing that the archetypes, you see, are just different manifestations of the divine and should not be confused with the divine. So in Hindu religion you have a lot of deities, but they are not God in our sense. I mean, they are an expression of Atma Brahma. So many other systems, they have deities, but they have also one supreme principle that is the generating principle of everything. And so according to Joseph Campbell, any deity that gets stuck with an archetype is worship of idols. So then the question was, when do people have the feeling they arrive? When do people have the feeling they're really in touch with the supreme principle, the universe? And I found those states uh, fell into two categories, where people really felt they were at the cradle of everything, they either understood what it was about, they had all their questions answered, or they were in a state where there was no need to ask questions, which is the same as understand everything. If you don't have any more questions to ask, uh, you know, you have a sense of understanding, you have a sense of arriving, you have a sense of fulfillment. Now one of these states uh, was a state which uh, can be called void. Some people, sophisticated people, talk about it as supracosmic and metacosmic void. It means it's emptiness that is supraordinated to everything and also in some sense underlies everything. You can find in Buddhist scriptures statements like form is emptiness and emptiness is form. So there's a state of mind that you can go into in a non-ordinary state of consciousness uh, which is a state of absolute metaphysical emptiness, nothingness. There's nothing there yet it's conscious of itself, there's a point of consciousness that's aware of that emptiness and there's paradoxically also the sense that there's nothing missing in that state. There's potential for all of existence, but none of it is concretized in any way. And you can link it to quantum physics. This is exactly what quantum physicists come to, talking about the dynamic void, talking about the um, probabilities, everything ultimately being just probabilities, but nothing is really manifested until it's observed and so on. So that is one state where you have the feeling you are, you are, there is a sense of understanding where things come from. It's not understanding here, it's experiential understanding of the gut level. This is the source of existence. It comes from nothingness. Now this is tremendously important in understanding uh, the psychology of Western cultures and uh, in comparison, for example, to the Oriental cultures. We had a meeting in 85 in Kyoto, which was the International Transpersonal Association, and this was the time when there was tremendous conflict between Japan and uh, the United States in business. You remember these uh, difficulties? And they were having conferences trying to straighten it out. And there was a Jungian Japanese uh, psychologist at the conference, Dr. Kawai, and he gave a talk on uh, the differences between the Japanese mind and the Western mind in Jungian terms, in terms of the underlying archetypes, in terms of the underlying mythology, and he showed that the Oriental philosophy is a system with an empty center. Creation comes out of nothing. Creation comes out of emptiness. Our mythology in the center is the power station. There is creative power. The creation comes out of the creative impulse. And then, if you follow that, you get a totally different cosmology that has then reflection on the hierarchies in culture and so on. Whether you see the whole system as being uh, self-supported, interconnected, or whether you see it as a system where you can have selective hierarchic control over things and so on, which is very much the, the Western psychology. So people who have powerful experiences of the void they emerged basically with a new philosophy, which is different from Western, and they feel a tremendous resonance with things like the I Ching, which expresses this kind of philosophy, the Taoist 
type of thinking. Now, when you are in that state, you can also understand uh, how something can come out of nothing, how creation can come out of emptiness. Again, this is something that is absolutely inconceivable for the left hemisphere thinking. You know, that we have a system in science where we believe everything is cause and effect. Uh, only when you take it all the way back and you're in trouble. Because then you have the question, what was the first cause? What was before the first cause? If there was a first mover, who moved that mover and so on? Uh, and you see the absurdity of the system. Of course, science doesn't deal with it, or didn't deal with it until quantum physics, until people like Hawking and so on talking about, again, creation out of nothing. If you read Hawking, Steve Hawking, he would say things like, nothingness has no other choice than to create existence. But you don't get very far with the cause and effect thinking which we are dominated by in science and in uh, our culture. That simply doesn't work. And we just draw a line there. We don't deal with that in science. And we play a game. We think we have it down. Everything is very reasonable. Uh, and we sort of ignore that big hole. It's like the, the Sufi story when uh, a man goes and sees somebody under a lamp, sort of looking for something on the ground. He says, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for a key. He says, where did you lose it? He says, over there. He says, why are you looking for it here? He says, well, it's dark there. I wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> so, so you have a very reasonable scientific system, only you don't deal with things where you wouldn't have a chance. Like, you don't ask questions. You just say, well, consciousness somehow comes out of matter, it comes from your brain. You don't ask the question, how does that happen? How can that kind of thing happen? Because you wouldn't have a chance. So you deal with those kinds of manifestations that make sense in your system. So you can talk about causes and effects, except when you go to the beginning. So that, that kind of thinking doesn't apply. We just will not deal with that stuff. So in the non-ordinary state, you get experiential sense how that can happen. You know, something comes out of, uh, out of nowhere. But you have to understand that you are also in a situation where you don't believe anymore that this is matter. This is, this is solid stuff. This is solid Newtonian stuff. So you're not, not really, on that level, you're not dealing with the question, where does matter come from? You are dealing with the question of consciousness technology. How is the experience of matter created? And that's a whole other ball game. We might be able to do it electronically 10 years from now. I mean, you can, you can fool yourself with a hologram. You can fool yourself optically. You can create form. You can, uh, with holophonic sound, you can sort of synchronize it with uh, acoustics. You can have a talking person holographic person and your only remaining sense is touch in this kind of holography you go there and if you go through it's a hologram if something tells you you can't go any further and you get a tactile sensation it's a body there it's a solid object so you know 10 20 years from now we can have something like holography that's going to do something to our touch what Aldous Huxley called the feelies you go to the movies and you know you get a few electrodes and you will not just see and hear but when uh, they're making love, you also start doing something to your pelvis. And, and, uh, and, and at that point, there's no way of telling difference between technology of consciousness and reality. So anyway, when you go to the point of the void, you understand the creation, but not the creation of matter. You get the understanding of the creation of the illusion of the world. And you get the kind of the, the Hollywood aspect of the divine play of Leela. How is that show created? What kind of technology goes into it? Now the first more tangible expression of the void, the first stage of creation, then is a different state of mind. And again, it's very difficult to describe in words. People usually complain, not having words, not having language for it. But they will tell you something. And so when I studied those descriptions, when people talked about that state, it boiled down to basically three different things. One is, if you are in that state, you know that you exist. There is existence. There is consciousness, awareness, knowledge. And the state is blissful. 
there are no forms yet, you know, there are no, nothing specific, nothing tangible. It's just a state of being in which you know you are, you know you are conscious, and you know that you are experiencing uh, your existence as being blissful. It's a state of overwhelming bliss. Now, if you go into Oriental scriptures, particularly into Sanskrit, you'll find the term for this. This is called Sat Chit Ananda. Sat means to exist or existence. Chit means uh, sometimes translated as awareness, uh, consciousness, and so on. And Ananda is bliss. So this is the supreme principle. This is the creative principle. This is out of which all this seems to come. And if you are in that state, you are experiencing it, you know that it's you. I mean, you have become that principle, so at that point you don't see it as something outside of yourself. And this is the message from the Upanishad, Tatvam Asi, thou art that. Now the way to think about it is that as you move through an altered state of consciousness, boundaries become illusory. I can become another person, I can become an elephant, I can become, you know, something 20 years ago. Uh, I can become the dancing Shiva. So, again, if you move out of our cognizantric state, where everything that you experience in non-ordinary state of consciousness doesn't count, you start questioning whether you are your body ego, because it's also based on your experience that you're a body. If you experience yourself in a very convinced way as not being a body or being another body, you know, that is an interesting piece of information. And once you start taking those states as significant, you start redefining who you are. And if you had a few transpersonal experiences all the way to the Sachinananda principle, you realize that your identity is not fixed. You are the body ego, that's certainly one interesting, relevant aspect of it, but you are also the Sachinananda principle, and you're also anything in between and around it. Because you can experience boundaries of various kinds. If you experience yourself as an elephant, you also have boundaries, but those are boundaries of an elephant. Uh, so there are all kinds of things in which you create boundaries within an infinite continuum, but they're all relative. They, you can move through it, you realize that they are not mandatory. They're not absolute states. So your true identity, then, if you take the message from non-ordinary states, is you are the totality of cosmic energy, your totality of consciousness, and within that, at different times, on different levels, you can experience yourself locked within systems that have boundaries, but those boundaries are not absolute. They, they feel very real, they feel very absolute at the time when it's happening, but it's all negotiable. You are not really ultimately bound by any of them. So this is the idea, you know, we are all God. We are all the totality of cosmic energy, because none of us have boundaries. So it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, I am the divine, you are not. That awareness has little to do with the body ego. It's like a pyramid where there are a lot of stones here, and then on each higher level there are less and less stones until at the top there is just one uh, entity then. And on that level, because we are also that, on that level we are all one. On this level, obviously, you know, the sense of separateness has some uh, meaning. So this comes as this identification was Sat Chit Ananda, sort of infinite being, infinite awareness, knowledge, and infinite bliss. Then when people reach that state, then uh, certain questions start emerging, particularly in those of us who are more inquisitive and curious than others. And that is, it's obvious to you that creation somehow comes from there. It's obvious that it's the cosmic furnace the stuff that's throwing out the forms and creates the different levels of reality, different, different kinds of reality. Now the question comes, two questions, why does that principle bother? You know, why does it create all those things? And the other one is, how does it do it? <laughs> and again, a lot of people would come up with answers to those questions, and they're pretty similar. There are varieties but they're pretty similar. So the question why, why does it create? First of all, that question why in the, the way we experience it on this level doesn't make that much sense there. 
what happens to you, you experience how that creation happened. You are that source and then you experience the emergence out of form, out of that source, so you understand it on a gut level. You don't have an answer that would necessarily satisfy you on this level, but it's a state-bound answer which is experiential. Now, if some people try to describe it, uh, they do something interesting, which I have seen earlier in uh, many of the people who were labeled psychotic, and that is when they write something, it's going to be full of capital letters. You know, it's love, but it's not love, it's love with capital L, and it's, and it's loneliness, but it's not just ordinary loneliness, it's not the kind of loneliness that you can experience, but something to do with it, it's loneliness with a capital L. So some people would tell you that that source creates because of its incredible richness, because it's, of its abundance, it's so overflowing with potential, it's so overflowing with creativity that it just has to give it out. On this level, the parallel would be an artist who has a lot of inspiration and would suffer tremendously if it just doesn't come out in some way. I mean, it simply has to do it. Another biological parallel would be a cell that will divide. At a certain point, you see there is churning and there, is, there are tensions and then something starts happening and before you know, there are two out of one. It comes out of uh, inner tension that is an expression of that richness richness and creative potential and also creative need. The source does not have a choice, it has to do it. It is part of its basic nature to do that. So some people say it's the inner richness. Uh, there are people who will say also it's also a loneliness. As fantastic as this state is, there's just one consciousness and there is something like craving for partnership, to share, to have something to relate. And the creation then comes out of that need to have something different from oneself. Uh, other people say love. It, this has something to do with uh, love. It's a gesture of love. Other people emphasize more the aspect of experiment, that there is tremendous curiosity. What is possible? What happens if? What happens if there is a universe where something that in its very principle is a spiritual entity will suddenly start believing that it is a limited body and has these sort of uh, it has two hands, two legs, it needs this substance called oxygen, has to eat. Uh, what happens if there are going to be two of them in some kind of polarity like male-female? What will happen if there is something like linear time and there is evolution and at different times people will wear different costumes and so there's a, there is a, an experimentation happening, there's research happening, there is a exploration uh, happening. Uh, there's an extreme statement which some people made and which is actually the same as you find in uh, the Kabbalah, which is uh, the principle creates out of boredom. As beautiful as it is, it's monotonous, too much of the same, uh, and there is a need for change. Uh, you find this, again, artistic expression of it in Wagner's Tannhäuser, when Tannhäuser, who was the Troubadour, the Minnesänger, ends up in uh, Venusberg, which is the Venus mountain. It's a mountain uh, with a hollow inside, uh, inhabited by nymphs and satyrs and the most exquisite orgies happening, and uh, the goddess of love, and he spent several years there, and then after this he starts craving trivia. You see, so <laughs> wants to go back, and it wouldn't be bad to suffer a little, and then... Um, he finally sort of utters the, the name of Maria and the mountain opens and he's out back to the world which is a mixed bag from this place where there is only uh, rapture and ecstasy and, and so that's creation out of boredom now then the other question that people are asking is how does it happen what is the technology of consciousness how are realities created out of consciousness the answer that most people do give involves two principles that sort of cooperate with it with each other. One is it happens by the method of divisions. Something that is undivided, that is one, splits somehow and becomes many. The second process that goes hand in hand is something like partitioning 
or some people say cosmic screen work, that means these split units of consciousness um, experience themselves as separate from each other and separate from the source from which they came. So somehow the element of uh, self-deception and false, uh, uh, sort of an illusion of separateness comes. A certain screen work, partitioning comes. Now you can't think about this as in terms of masonry. In technology of consciousness, this is more like forgetting. You see, that would be a much, much better metaphor. Alan Watts wrote a book, uh, which is called A Book uh, About the Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. This is the idea of forgetting who we are, partitioning, screen work, and so on. Well, we can say that through these two mechanisms, then these different levels of realities are created. One of them is the archetypal. There are sort of other kinds of worlds, universes. And one of these sort of holographic channels, if you want, in the world of consciousness, would be what we know as phenomenal reality. Ultimately, it would not be any more real or less real than the world of the great mother goddess. In electronic technology, there are different channels. Sumerian underworld is channel 26, uh, and you can spend some time there. Uh, you know, this is uh, channel 3, and, and you can be there and you can believe that there is only channel 3 until somebody pushes the button and you switch to channel 6. But when we are here, we like to believe that this is the only one that is real and the others are some kind of... Uh, derivatives of this one. Those other receptions are not real. But if you look into it, uh, in deep non-ordinary states, you'll find out it's all created by the same technology. The fact that this looks uh, you know, more solid and so on, or more predictable, this is produces trick in that understanding. Like if you have a movie and you have a producer that controls filmmaking, he can take you on any kind of trip. You see, it makes it sort of nice and solid and clear. And when you're looking at it, you say, now this is an episode of real life. And then you see the guy going to bed, and then the images sort of become black and white, and then it becomes a little blurred and sort of a little more fleeting. You say, you know, the hero's dreaming. And then you see somebody taking a pill, and then colors become very vivid, and there's some kind of strange distortions, and you say, the guy's tripping. But on the Hollywood level, all it takes is one kind of technology. Those are tricks. You use different kind of experiential qualities for different experiences, and you can create different worlds, different nuances. So again, in something like Vipassana meditation, where you analyze perception, or in something like non-ordinary states, you can sort of see through it. It would be like up to this point, you were just watching the movie screen, and you thought all there was was out there, and you couldn't figure it out, there were problems. Like, you know, in some movies there were flying saucers, in other, it was like Bambi, animals were talking, and you couldn't sort of get it quite together how it all is one reality. And one tremendous thing in Kashmir Shaivism would tell you, don't do that, that's a waste of time. To stay in the ordinary state of consciousness and collecting information and trying to make sense out of it, because what you are experiencing is part of the story. This is the same thing that David Bohm is who's a co-worker of Einstein's, he's saying these days about science. Don't have the illusion that science is telling you anything about what the universe is like. Historical periods are art forms of the collective unconscious. So with Middle Ages comes medieval science, with 20th century comes 20th century science. They are not studying the same universe in different ways, more or less developed. This belongs, science and the forms of religion belongs to the art form of a particular time. There's no way scientists can step out of the show because whatever they are doing is part of the story on the screen. So in Kashmir Shaivism would be as long as you want entertainment, you watch out there. If you are interested what it is about, this is not out there, you have to turn and then you find out that there is some kind of source of light, there is some kind of celluloid, that something is throwing pictures, then you can ask, what, is there a level behind it? And then you find out Hollywood, then you find somebody had a screenplay, somebody wanted you to have a certain kind of experience. 
And that is the explanation for why you are experiencing what you are experiencing. Things which are out there are not causally related at all. It, they wanted you to believe that they are causally related. If you see a, a Western and there is a cowboy shooting and an Indian falling off the horse, you make a connection in your head, say, the guy fell off the horse because the other guy shot him. Right? Wrong. <laughs> the guy fell off the horse because they wanted you to believe that the guy was shot. And they also orchestrated some other kinds of things. They made, made a hole and something was dripping out of the hole. Uh, what is the reason why the guy fell off the horse? It's in the screenplay. It's because somebody was giving you an art form which involved a certain kind of experience and it has to be nicely orchestrated, put together, so you can read into it causal connections. Now you can have states of mind when you will see that this is not any different. The reason why things happen in a certain way is because there is a certain higher order screenplay and all the elements in what we are experiencing are governed by that so whatever you are discovering in this level, you, you are part of the script. You are not stepping out of the script and making any kind of objective judgments about the script. I'm not saying this is so. I'm, do you understand what I'm reporting? How people see the universe in non-ordinary states. And you can bring a good argument for this. I mean, it's, uh, in a sense, it's better than the one that we live with because it covers much more information. It is a conceptualization for a much wider range of observations and experiences. And also it takes into consideration not just ordinary consciousness, but things that happen in other states of consciousness. Okay, now there is another question that people frequently ask, and that's a very interesting one. And that is, why is evil in the world? I mean, some of those experiences are experiences that we don't particularly like. And that's true for the non-ordinary states as much as it is true for our everyday life. There are things that we enjoy. There are other things that we could live without. There are other things that we really don't want as part of our life. So people ask very serious questions. You know, what is evil? Why is evil in the world? They ask uh, this question, uh, Ramakrishna. Say, Swamiji. Why is evil in the world? And he sort of thought about it for a while and he said, to thicken the plot. Uh, <laughs> um, now, since we are talking about the movies, you imagine that we would take out of our world everything that we think shouldn't be there. Everything's bad, unpleasant, evil, so certainly we don't want to be sick. So let's take out diseases. Nobody has any kind of problem. We are all ideally healthy. And we do it with all of human history. Now you can't do this in an isolated fashion. You take out diseases. Now here goes the history of medicine. We don't have any heroes. We don't have any Virchows. We don't have any Pasteurs. We don't have the discovery, the exciting discovery of uh, penicillin. Here goes Mother Teresa. There's no place for Mother Teresa. You don't have evil. You don't need church. You see, you do it a few times, take out a few things that we think shouldn't be there. You end up with a plot that is so flat that if somebody would make it to a movie, we wouldn't bother to go and watch it. I mean, think about the movies that fall in that category. They, don't, they are not the movies that fill the movie theaters. So. You see, we want something very deep essence in us, wants all that whole range of experiences. You know, people go to movies where you explore just incredible dimensions of beings, which you wouldn't possibly dream about experiencing if they were real. The possibility to experience it is because you know it is as if. You can put yourself in a state where you're actually experiencing it, but you can also, if it gets too heavy, you can step back and say, what am I doing? This is just a movie. But you go there, you want it anyway. So this idea is that the cosmic artist, if you want, the creative consciousness, it will also tend to enact all kinds of uh, possibilities. 
Now, in the concrete sense, then people ask the questions uh, about evil, and they very frequently find out that in order to create out of itself, the cosmic principle has to negate itself. So the first step in the process of creation would be something like a negative mirror image of the Satchinananda. If you think about it, what we consider bad, evil, painful, unpleasant, fits into three major categories, and each of them is a negation of one of the aspects of the creative principle. The first part of it is Sat, which is being, existence, infinite being. It's not one nice category of evil, bad things, which have to do with non-existence, not being, or limited existence. The fact that we don't live forever, we age, we die, we can lose our life. Those are things that have to do with negation of existence. Uh, the second one is Chit, which is uh, awareness, knowledge. So that category is limited awareness or ignorance. And then the most obvious category is the, the negation of ananda, of bliss, which would be the whole spectrum of pain, unpleasant, negative emotions, physical pain, uh, difficult experiences, and so on. So we would have this negative image of the Satchinananda, the negation of it, and then in the overall cosmic scheme where you have partitioning, uh, and you have divisions, you will find out that what we call evil, what we call bad, is actually identical with the partitioning principle. It is the principle that makes us feel separate from each other and separate from the source that keeps us in oblivion of who we really are. Our essence is we are spiritual beings that have infinite existence. And then a lot of what we call suffering, all of it actually, comes from the fact that we are not aware of that, we are not in touch with that reality. In other words, if we knew that this is not as real as we think it is, we would have a very different freedom in experiencing the whole range. If I really were convinced that death is not real, you know, that would make a tremendous difference in my life. Now, another question that people would be asking now, given the fact that we have something like the creative source, the void, the Satchinananda, we have the certain transcendental need to create of the creative principle, we have something about the mechanics that involves the divisions and the partitioning, and the whole thing is somehow serving the purpose of this fantastic adventure in consciousness, this adventure, this experiment, uh, this divine play, Leela, as the Hindus call it, which accounts for fantastic adventures, possibilities, and, and different levels. Then the question is, how does it happen that I buy a certain self-image that is false? How is it possible that if I am an unlimited spiritual being, I am sort of uh, tricked into understanding or to believing that I am a Newtonian object, that I am a solid body, that I need to eat, that I need oxygen. Now the best answer that I have uh, heard so far, and it also was confirmed by some of my own uh, experiences, is the following. The whole universe is like this fantastic adventure in consciousness, this incredible cosmic dance. It's a play, it's a piece of art among others. If you look again at the parallel on the human level with art, a good art will almost replace reality. If you see a good theater play and good performance of actors, or a good movie, you might forget you're in the movies and you really get yourself into it. And, uh, if it's a good love story, you know, you might experience sexual arousal, and if it's uh, exorcist, some people will throw up and they can't stand it and they get out of there as if something was really happening there. So, if something is really done with powerful means, it can substitute reality, it can sort of pass for reality. So, there is a certain degree of perfection that would be mimicking reality. Now, the source that we are talking about has um, intelligence and creativity and capacity which is unimaginable on the level to which we are reduced. I mean, this would be like 
Chopin playing the piano and then reducing himself to a cockroach and then let himself be uh, admired sort of by uh, or a gopher watching a mathematician solving differential equations. I mean, it's that kind of relationship between the intelligence that is available in everyday life and the intelligence that created this. So it has incredible capacity to create an art form where everything is accounted for. All the loopholes are covered in such a way that the principle traps itself with its own perfection. I mean, it creates a show which is so believable that it traps itself. I will give you an example of Baltimore because one of the persons who experienced this gave that example. Now, if you add to this something like uh, square miles of ugly houses, red and black, uninteresting in Baltimore, people living their sort of trivial lives, uh, you know, snoring and farting and sweating and, and so on. <laughs> it takes some analysis and you have to go to some other levels to realize that this comes from a perfect source. So, uh, um, unless you realize that that was the very purpose, was to create a believable system that would pass for trivial, ordinary, mundane, material reality. Uh, Aurobindo has this, uh, his extreme statement about the atheist. The atheist is God playing hide and seek with himself. <laughs> so the atheist would be like the extreme trick of the creative principle. It created something that tries to believably deny itself and so on. But there are some more subtle tricks like those you know, the suburbs in Baltimore, so you can substitute anything you want to for that, but I'm sure you find lots of examples. Now, in, in non-ordinary states of consciousness, you can see through that. You can see the absolute perfection in the trivial, in the mundane, and you can see that it's a necessary part of the creation. So there's absolutely no hierarchy of values, aesthetic or any others. If you take something like kitsch, you, from your human level, you might be very snobbish about it. I mean, it's a really low-level kind of stuff. As long as that person who did it was trying to be like Michelangelo. As long as this was created from a place where it was meant to be kitsch. It's exactly the kinds of emotional reactions that it's going to done. It's a piece of perfection. Do you know what I'm saying? A toad is a toad. And it fits exactly the place it's supposed to fit. It creates an aesthetic impact on us, which is what was meant to mean. So in, again, back to the movies. You know, there are movies where people want to create an atmosphere of horror or extreme ugliness. It's experimenting with states of consciousness and so on. So from that point of view, there are absolutely no hierarchies. Chimpanzee is just as good as Einstein. I mean, chimpanzee is God, which is sort of perfectly incarnate in a chimpanzee, it was meant to be a chimpanzee. Einstein is a, the same principle that created what was supposed to be Einstein. So once you have this kind of meta framework, Einstein is no better than a chimpanzee. The chimpanzee is perfect for what it was supposed to be as much as a scientist is. I even have a very strong feeling that this applies for example, to animals, that the whole idea that their limitations come from uh, their brain capacities, whether they have ganglia or whether they have a brain or how big a brain it is, uh, I really don't believe that this is a relevant way of thinking about it. I believe that each form has a piece of the absolute cosmic intelligence that it's supposed to have for that particular form. So you have these miraculous things where of navigation of birds and so on, and we're trying to put it into their brains and explain it in some kind of natural ways and you know we don't have a lot of success. Uh, one situation that hit me in a very very hard way was we had a house in uh, Big Sur and we had a roof that was overlapping, we had a deck with a railing and we had a hibachi grill standing there and one morning I came out to look at the ocean and there was this most beautiful large spider web and it was anchored, parts of it were anchored on the railing, parts of it on the hibachi, 
parts of it were coming from the overlapping roof. Now, this kind of thing cannot be done with a few ganglia. I mean, that creature had to have a three-dimensional idea, had limitations. I mean, it couldn't fly, it had to travel in its own way. But you see, to get from this place to that one, it had to go down from the hibachi, go crawl up, go this way, that way, fix it in the right place, and had to have a sense of a geometric of the mandala that it was creating. It was creating it from the limitations of the spider. But the idea that you could explain that from that nervous system which was there is just not a very believable theory anymore. So th there's a possibility that each creation, each creature is sharing just the right piece, just the right form of absolute cosmic intelligence. It is good for what it is. So we have now this system where we have the creative source, we have these different levels inhabited by entities that are actually split units of consciousness that have forgotten where they came from, they forgot that they are part with everything else, they experience themselves as, as separate, and this provides the possibility of this fantastic cosmic dance on different levels, the dramas, and there's a tendency in this system to experiment with whatever can be experimented with. Again, we have our own human ideas about it, what is appropriate, what should be there, what shouldn't be there, you know, the kinds of things we did around sexuality, whether you can be homosexual or you should be heterosexual, you should have one wife or you could have 15 wives and, uh, you know, what degree of intimacy can you have with your brother and sister? Well, that's true for a certain culture. That's not true for the creative principle. That is interested what kind of experience it is if two persons of the same sex interest, what, how does it differ from when it is people from the same sex, uh, what does it feel like when you put this end to that end, and what does it, uh, 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 what, you know, what does it feel like, what experiential possibilities there are if you turn it around. If you take a culture like New Caledonia, they kill fraternal twins if they were male and female because they committed incest in the womb. You go to Peru or you go to Egypt and within the Pharaoh family or the Inca family, the brother has to marry the sister, otherwise it's a scandal. You know, you have cultures where monogamy is such that something else will be punished by death. You have cultures where this polygamy, you have cultures where there is polyandry, uh, you have cultures where uh, they feel perfectly comfortable being nude. You have others where you, you, know, you show your nose and you get killed for that because you should have your face covered. I mean, these are all trips. I mean, we, take, you know, we are programmed into taking this, absolutely, we are ethnocentric. Each culture has an idea what is acceptable, what is right, what isn't right. But once in non-ordinary states you get an overview and those are all plays. I mean, it's like watching different movies. You know, it's appropriate if you live in a certain culture to play it by the rules. But you can also have another dimension where you have a degree of freedom, where you just see all those are relative things. You don't get caught into those games where people get excited and fighting about these issues and so on. Now, the other thing that people discover within this system, this is just one half of it, going from one to many, from the void or from Sachinananda to uh, a level like this, when you have a lot of separate entities, some are male, some are female, some are black, some are yellow, some are white. Uh, you know, some live in one century, others live in another century, some of them are human, some of them are animals, and so on. And then all these sort of uh, interactions. And then the idea is that within the same system, they're also built in mechanisms through which you can escape the sense of separation and being sort of committed to a particular partial form, and you get a way out into, in non-ordinary states of consciousness, you can sort of dissolve these boundaries and you can start the journey back when you somehow rediscover your own true identity, which you sort of, which you lost uh, contact with. So those are ways to reunion. So there are, there are like two movements, dynamics that coexisting in the system that we are. One goes from the source to separation, to divisions. The other one is from separation back to unity. Now comes catch 22. Uh, in many of the religious systems you will find out that 
they would consider this level to be the kind of the low level. This is the garbage level. This is the quagmire of death rebirth. This is the uh, valley of tears. And you want out. I mean, the last thing you want to do is to stay here. So you want out of the cycle of death rebirth. You want to nirvana. So this is the original, for example, Hinayana Buddhism, where the idea was you want to extinguish the, the torch of life. You want to get beyond the, the thirst of flesh and blood. You want to be in uh, nirvana. And nirvana means literally evanescence. You want to fade out of existence. It's too much trouble. It's all associated with suffering. Uh, the Jainist uh, religion has the same kind of thing. You are jiva, you're sort of crystalline, pure entity, monad of life, and you are entangled, contaminated by your association with the biological way of existence. You want to purify that, and you want to move into this sort of pristine state beyond incarnation, beyond existence. Now, people who had that experience of union with God back to the source realize that there is a problem because that's where creation came from in the first place. So if that state were so satisfying, so self-fulfilling, none of these other things would be here. The principle would simply stay where it is, wouldn't bother to do these other things. So that there's a discovery that there is no way that principle can not to create. It is a fundamental, transcendental need of that state to create out of itself. So now what is the solution? The solution here, according to the insights that people get when they get to those levels, is that the level of the phenomenal world and the transcendental level of the Satchinananda, those are two complementary realities. They somehow need each other. You find in some of the spiritual literature is that people need God, but God also needs people. Or in some of the aboriginal religions, you see God's created humanity for a particular uh, purpose. So there's a kind of symbiosis, there's an interaction, dynamics, there's a dialectic uh, dialogue sort of happening. The solution then would be to be here fully, here, sort of incarnate, to be in the world, to be in the phenomenal world. This is the solution which was also found in the Mahayana Buddhism, where the nirvana is not evanescence, it's not going out of here, but it's to eliminate certain forces uh, within this incarnation that makes existence tolerable or even exciting. And the three forces are represented by a pig, by a rooster, and by a snake. Those forces are anger, aggression, desire, lust, and ignorance. So if you can eliminate some, if you can inner transformation, overcome or diminish those three forces within yourself, then you can be in the phenomenal world incarnate and at the same time, you don't experience profound suffering. Or if you go through something unpleasant, you have this meta framework to which you can sort of relate it. So the idea is that this level has something to offer, a certain experiential possibilities that the undifferentiated uh, cosmic state does not have. It has it in a potential form, but not concretized. Only on this level can you have a child. Only on this level can you uh, listen to Beethoven or go uh, windsurfing or go uh, hiking or eat bouillabaisse or whatever your thing is, uh, whatever you enjoy. So this level has something to offer, but to be totally identified just with this in other words, to lose the awareness that it's a play and take it, to buy it, sort of be a real sucker for the, you know, the, to, to believe that this is all there is, means to getting lost in the play, to be like in the movies and believing that what's happening is there, rather than believing that it's this play of vibrations, of shadows and lights and so on. So the idea would be to be here, experience whatever is part of the experience, but have also this other level, this sort of meta level, the sense of one's true identity. It would be like Olivier, you know, playing uh, Othello or whatever it is, Hamlet, and being fully involved in it and really be part of the play, but somewhere in the, in the back of the head there is also the knowledge that you are not really uh, a murderer, that you are 
Lawrence Olivier and so on. Sometimes people give also this parallel with, um, you know, how do we understand our role? It's the question of free will and determinism. Uh, when you go to, uh, or used to go to S training, I don't know where Werner is now, the final message was, you're God, you created your own universe. And there was a peculiar kind of confusion. It was like me, Stan, you see, as you see here, I created the universe. Now, I know that's not true. What seems to be true, at least in non-ordinary states, is all of us created what is here, but not from where we sit now, but from the top of the pyramid. In other words, the fact is that what we are playing now is certain roles in a screenplay which was written by all of us when we were still one entity. So the idea would be like Shakespeare has a concept of a play, let's say Hamlet. At the beginning, all the characters are just thought forms in one, within one mind. And to make it a really good show, you need separate entities. I mean, if they're not real separate individuals, nobody gets killed, you know, uh, nobody can love and hate anybody else, so you wouldn't have a real story. So for that purpose you need separate entities, you need real characters. And what can happen is that theoretically Shakespeare could write the play and cast himself as Hamlet. Now from the level from which he was writing the play, he had a different degree of free will than from the level from when you are cast into a role, because there it's pretty much determined. And the problem here, the, the free will and determination and so on, comes from what Gregory Bateson would call an error in typing. That means the Shakespeare who wrote the play is not the same Shakespeare who is in the cast. You know, there's no absolute conflict between free will and determinism depends on with which level we identify. Are we really aware of our true identity or are we identifying with the actor? Are we identifying with the, with the protagonist? Now how does this relate to what we're doing? The holotropic breathing, how does it relate to what we call psychopathology? Traditionally what we call psychopathology. Now up to this point uh, Western science has been exploring a certain image of human beings as being Newtonian objects, solid entities, skin encapsulated egos, if you want complex biological machines, thinking machines, highly developed animals, this is the image that we got in the medical school. And in this context consciousness is seen as a product of the brain. It's some of the extreme forms of materialism like what is now called vulgar materialism, you can find statements like there's nothing special about consciousness, consciousness is just an organic physiological function. The brain produces consciousness like the kidneys produce urine. Uh, um, so this is the extreme of the medical model. I mean the, the consciousness somehow comes of the, as an epiphenomenon, it has to do with the complexity of the neurophysiological processes. Now you have people like Penfield, who was one of the founders of neurosurgery, of brain research. Uh, he died, and just before his death he wrote a book called The Mystery of Mind. And in a nutshell, uh, his conclusion was, as far as he's concerned, consciousness cannot possibly come out of the brain. I mean, there's some kind of parallelism happening between the neurophysiological processes and consciousness, but the idea that the whole thing is happening inside of your skull, it just didn't make it for him after decades of really daily, systematic daily research on neurosurgery, neurophysiology and so on. But this is the image of human beings that we have. Now what's coming now from modern consciousness research, from psychedelic research, from the breathing and other experiential psychotherapies and so on, from near-death experiences, from thanatology, uh, from some of the more enlightened anthropologists who work with shamans and so on, call themselves visionary anthropologists, who actually participate in rituals rather than sitting on the tree with a writing pad and sort of observing what the natives are doing. We have now powerful confirmation coming from these modern developments in science that confirm now quite systematically another image of human beings that has been around for centuries or millennia as part of the so-called perennial philosophy.
I don't know if you ever thought about, uh, again, another major problem that we have in science, and that is that if the world is really material, we'll never know it. It is not testable. It is not something that's accessible with our limitations, that's accessible in principle to scientific investigation. We are fooling ourselves thinking that sciences are studying the material universe. Astronomy is not a science about stars. The astronomy is a science of human experiences of what we call stars. Mineralogy is not a science about stones. Mineralogy is a science about human experiences with what we call stones. And it deals also with things like colors and so on, which we know are not around. Even physical terms, what we call colors is a perception of different levels of frequencies. There's nothing around like colors. This is a purely subjective term. And there's no way of getting beyond that because whatever we experience is a human experience. This is the old Kantian problem between phenomena and nomena, or uh, so-called things in themselves, Dinge an, an sich. If I'm perceiving Jim, you know, what I'm supposedly doing, something in me, this is not defined in science what it is, is interpreting biochemical changes in my cortex, which were created by light bouncing off what I perceive as Jim, exciting my retina, translate it into a neural impulse, and ultimately doing some biochemical changes in my cortex. And something in me reads that, works with it. As a result of this process, I come up with something that even remotely uh, resembles what is really out there is not a very convincing hypothesis. Okay. So we have this fact that if the world is material, we'll never know it because all we know is our experience of the world. I don't even know if I'm experiencing the way you are, if what is green for you is also green for me. But we somehow agree, by and large, with some minor friction problems and so on, we agree on certain things. This is a chair, it's there and so on. But we know that it cannot possibly be accurate reflection of something objective that we all are experiencing. There are tremendous varieties or differences in how we experience different things. So there is this other notion now coming, we are fields of consciousness, transcending time and space, having no limitations, transcending linear causality. You can experience it in meditation, you can experience it in spiritual emergencies, you can experience it in the breathing, you can experience it under hypnosis, in a trance state, you can experience it when you take psychedelic sessions and so on. So what we have to do now, because we know those things are real, a person can be dying and consciousness detaches from the brain and they would go and perceive something in the other part of the building. Blind people can see in an out-of-body state and so on. So what we end up with is some kind of strange paradox, a paradoxical definition of who we are, and that definition will be very strangely similar to what physicists like Fred Wolf came up was in relation to subatomic matter and also light. And that is the wave particle paradox. Subatomic matter is particles and waves at the same time. Light is photons or electromagnetic waves. In different experimental arrangements and the different circumstances, sometimes it's more appropriate to think about what you're seeing as photons. In some other experiments, it's more like light. And uh, Niels Bohr, who tried to solve this paradox, came up with what's called complementarity principle. In order to understand what light is, what subatomic matter is, you have to simply accept a paradox. Those are two complementary aspects of the same phenomenon. And you, no matter what you do, you will not get what Einstein always wanted, which is a visualizable model. You can really pin it down. You say, what is it? I mean, a particle is occupying a certain space, has a certain momentum, has certain coordinates. Waves are spread all over the place. So, and your brain is saying, you know, is it a particle or is it a wave? It cannot be both. Only this is the best we can do. We can say those are two complementary aspects. Sometimes un under certain circumstances we see more of the one, sometimes we see more of the other. Now, we can do something like this on the level of consciousness research and sciences that study human beings. We can say a human being is a Newtonian object, it is a biological machine, and it is also 
an infinite field of consciousness transcending time, space, and linear causality. Those are two complementary aspects of who we are. They manifest under different circumstances. And to really have some comprehension who we are, you have to accept those two with the paradox that's involved and with the sense of complementarity. Under certain circumstances, which means in what I call the hamburger stand rush hour consciousness, uh, it will be more appropriate to think about yourself as a body, you have a skin, you inhabit your skin, uh, you have certain limitations and so on. In non-ordinary states of consciousness, that self-definition is not appropriate. You will find out that you don't have those boundaries, those boundaries are not absolute, you might not experience yourself as solid, you break down into all kinds of energy fields, uh, you find out that you can be the person over there, you can be an animal, you can become the dancing Shiva and so on. Uh, so you have a very different um, sense of identity. So those are two complementary aspects of who we are, and each of them has a kind of uh, mode of consciousness that's associated with it. So we have one uh, aspect of ourselves, which is the Newtonian biological thinking machine. Let's call that C, consciousness. Now let's give it a name. Let's call it hylotropic. So I give it a little index here. Hylotropic. Uh, hile in uh, Greek means matter. Trepein means oriented towards. Heliotropism is the property of the plant moving towards the sun. Heliotropic. So hylotropic means matter oriented, moving towards matter. So in the terms of the cosmology that I was talking about, that's a movement from the void and the Satchinananda into incarnation, into the world of matter, into the world of phenomenal uh, manifestation. So we call it hylotropic. And these experiences in this state of consciousness will systematically confirm that you are body ego, that you are skin encapsulated ego, that you live in a Newtonian world where uh, objects are solid, two objects cannot occupy the same space. Uh, space is three-dimensional, time is linear, everything is cause and effect, and so on. And if you don't leave that state, this is what it's going to be for you. You, will, you might believe that that's really the way it is. You can go into deep meditation, into hypnosis, into the breathing, into psychedelic states, into spiritual emergency, and suddenly this is not true, you are in a state that we can call holotropic. Holos means whole, and trepein against means moving towards. So this means moving towards totality, moving towards wholeness. So in the cosmology it would be a movement from separate identity back towards undifferentiated unity, melting of boundaries, experiencing bigger and bigger holes, and so on. So we are some kind of dynamic we are a stage in which these two movements are in constant sort of dialectic interchange. We mentioned before that the undifferentiated cosmic consciousness wants to incarnate, wants to become many, and when we end up on the other side, it's too much of a hassle, too much of a pain, and something in us wants to go back. We have the need to transcend. So these experiences in the holotropic consciousness would systematically Confirm if you have enough of them, you are not solid, you are a system of energy. You can go beyond that, you find out that the world is just an orchestration of experiences. Or if it isn't, that's all you can say about it, as I mentioned before. This is one of the major exercises in Vipassana meditation, that you sit and you analyze your experience of the world. And all you know is there are visual experiences, there are acoustic experiences, there are tactile experiences, pains and so on, and you may, out of it, you make the image of the material world. But all we have is experiences. But like in the movies, when I was talking about the cowboy or the Indian falling of the horse, they are orchestrated in such a way that they give appearance of causing each other. Now, if this is true, if we have these two aspects and these two corresponding states of consciousness, none of them is pathological. They're two complementary aspects. A physicist would not call light that manifests as waves uh, a psychotic photon. It would say a sick photon. <laughs> it, would, it would say, at this point, in this particular experimental arrangement, 
light is showing its wave aspect. In another arrangement, it will show its particle aspect. But both of those are legitimate aspects of the system that we are working with. So there's nothing pathological about having holotropic type of experiences. It can be bad if it's happening in the wrong context, like that Albuquerque airport. That's not the place to exercise your holotropic aspects. You want to know that you're in the right place when it is happening. But if you are in the right place, it can be extremely educative, it can be healing, it can be transformative. There's nothing essentially pathological about it. So the idea would be, if it is true that we have these two aspects, to accept them, to cultivate those aspects, to complement what you're doing in everyday life with meditation, with participation in rituals, in experiential psychotherapy, whatever. You want to know that, you want to honor that aspect. Each of those forms is good for something and bad for something else. As I mentioned the other day, if you are a pilot landing a 747 in Kennedy Airport, and you want to be in the hylotropic mode. That's not the time to find out that you were an embalmer in ancient Egypt 2,000 years ago. <laughs> um, at that time, you're also not interested what it feels like when uh, an elephant gets a peanut into his uh, trunk. Uh, <laughs> It's not also time to have an out-of-body experience uh, and sort of float around the Empire State Building. You, you want to also know that the runway is solid, that you can rely on it, that you can trust the time-space coordinates, which are also coordinated with some of the, the other happenings around you and so on. You really want to be in the uh, ilotropic mode. Now, if you stay in that, if you never leave it, if, which is the ideal of normalcy in Western culture, the best psychiatrist should be one who has never had any holotropic states, maybe with the exception of some dreams. You know, we hide it from each other in staff meetings that we ever had those experiences. <laughs> because that would disqualify us, you know, a, a professional, you know, should never have that. He just treats the other poor things who happen to have these kinds of experiences. And what makes you expert is that you never experience, so you don't really know what they are going through which is different from the shamanic. The idea in the shamanic or the idea of a guru in India is you go to somebody who has been through what you are now going through and they go through it to the other side so they can tell you from their own experience what is happening to you. To go in a holotropic state of consciousness to somebody who has never left the holotropic mode, I don't care what degrees they have, I don't care what books they have read, is like having sexual problems and going to a pre-adolescent, you know, <laughs> discussing orgasm. And this is the whole idea, you know, to use for work in certain mental health facilities and so on, for working with people who are in psychotic states, somebody who has been there before, so that person can help from a very different place, or recovering people, helping others in 12-step programs and so on, have a very different possibility of understanding and treating than those who have never ever faced that problem. This is alien to the Western type of thinking. So the idea would be then cultivate those two states and be able to find right circumstances in which you have one or the other mode of consciousness. If you want to heal yourself, you want to heal others, I'm not talking about body mechanics, I'm talking about healing others, you want to do it in a holotropic state of consciousness. You don't want to do it in, in this state of consciousness. If you want to tap deep sources of creativity, the major creative uh, inspirations, inventions, if you read the history of creativity, always came from holotropic state. The person might have spent five years researching, studying, experimenting, but the real solution came then when they were waking up from a dream or like Heisenberg when he was sick uh, was hay fever so he couldn't see, that's where he got the ideas about quantum physics. The idea for an experiment that meant the discovery of adrenaline and the Nobel Prize came in a dream, and so on. We know the story of organic physics, the story of discovery of benzene that came again in a vision to Kekule when he saw an Ouroboros and he got the idea how the carbon atoms might be linked in the ring. So just the last thing here, there is an interface here that you want to stay away from. And that is 
when you are experiencing these two at the same time. In other words, you are in a context where you're supposed to be hylotropic, but you happen to have holotropic experiences. And then you have an enclave in your everyday life that we call psychopathology. You get an asthmatic attack here, and nobody's choking you, and you cannot breathe, which is an alien enclave in this way of existing in the world. Now, if you now use a technique which would take you into the underlying holotropic state, the experience that is trying to come through, you'll find out that you actually are drowning when you were 14 years ago, and you are dragging that situation to here. So the choking belongs to a different uh, system of time-space coordinates. You're living in two places and two different time frameworks at the same time. You're mixing those two. And then you find that deeper behind it, that you're really stuck in the birth canal. You feel sort of still more in the birth canal than you feel here. And behind it, there could be an experience of being hanged somewhere. So there are bits of pieces of yourself that you left somewhere else that really didn't make it. You're not fully in this situation. And those states are trying to uh, come into your present consciousness and sort of complete themselves. So the overlap here would be the situation that you want to stay away from. If you have this, the idea is to create a situation where you can go fully into this, find out what it is, experience it, then it takes you automatically back to the ordinary reality and the enclave will not be there. It sort of fully express itself. So what you get here now is a kind of dynamic tension. Something in the hylotropic is coming back to holotropic and the holotropic is trying to go back to the hylotropic, which is basically an expression of those two movements that we were talking about, from Satchinananda into creation and from creation back. So we are this kind of battlefield, and when those two modes of consciousness get mixed up, we experience them both together, that's what we call then psychopathology. If you can get it in a pure form, it is an authentic form of consciousness that's behind it. It is not a distortion of this one. If you see this one as just the only authentic, the only legitimate one, then uh, anything that comes, whether it comes in this form, will be seen as pathology, as something that doesn't belong. But if you have context to experiment with this mode, you will find out that they are legitimate experiences of a different kind. There's nothing wrong with either of those, but you don't want to experience them simultaneously. So I think this is all we can do in the time that we had. And, and, Okay.